wicked excited to be here. Like super, super, super excited because my entire security career started in this city. Um, so for those of you that don't know that, it it like gives me goosebumps. I was telling other people that. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong conference. Um, yeah, I was I was telling people that uh, when when I got here, I was on the phone with with some work stuff that was making me like really depressed. And so I was just doing the like depressed talk the whole year. And I got to my hotel room and it just blew me away when I looked out the window and I thought about all of the different times that I've had living here in the 10 plus years that I lived here. And it just completely, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it right now. It makes me really happy. Um, so th thank you guys for just being here and, and starting and having a community here because when, when I was here, I think it was something that all of us in this community really wanted, but nobody had really gone out and done. And so the best we could do would be like bitch each other at work and then, you know, like be happy about it kind of ish until we got wasted at the end of the night to try and figure out how many times it wasn't the firewall's fault. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I want to start by just thanking all you guys for, for being here. This is it's, it's something that's near and dear to me because if any of you understand the history of where B-Sides came from, um, it really came from us being pissed that it cost so much money to get access to information. So much money. When we looked at Black Hat and I was like, these pieces of sh I swear, I'm going to anyway, so I can deal with it. Um, these pieces of shit people cost four thousand dollars to go listen to one of my own fucking friends talk like the hell no and i'm like this is fucking retarded i'm not gonna do this and then i thought about all the people i didn't know who were like scrapping together to try and get money to go to this fucking four thousand dollar thing and i'm like bullshit house party we're throwing a house party i'm calling everybody that you want to talk to you want to hear their talk, I'm going to be like, yo, give the same talk at our house, we're not going to have any cameras, so put some dirt in it. And they were like, done. So all these people came over to this giant fucking house that I rented, that we almost burned to the ground. <laughs> Literally. Because some people aren't really good with, like, yeah, they computer well, but they don't electronic well. <laughs> yeah. So there was an AC unit that we bought from Sam's that we took back because it wasn't effective. But, you know, whatever we needed, we didn't have any money for that shit. Somebody, somebody had put an extension cord to the AC unit and left it curled, wrapped. Like, I don't know how many EEs are in here, but like, that's how you start fires. And so the funniest part about this damn thing was that we're leaving the house and we're wrapping up and we're like, okay, we're gonna go get burgers and a bunch of liquor and all this other shit. People will eventually be by. Don't burn the house down. We said the words, don't burn the fucking house down. And we came back and the carpet was black. <laughs> and I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. D Darrell, and he just looked at me and he was just like, <laughs> just gone. I was like, what happened? He's like, I mean, I was like, I forget it. Um, and then B-Sides was born. Uh, it, was, it was weird. It was weird to know that we had all these things happen and all of a sudden, everybody kind of came together and was at the house and having a really good time. We didn't have a motto. We didn't have a, a goal. We didn't, we had, you know what our goal was? Throw a house party where people could learn about shit. And people were like, man, that's, that's really cool. Um, Jack, Jack was an attendee, right? Jack came over to the house and it was really obvious from the beginning exactly who was going to do things and which people were there, which people were just kind of eh, tourists. Um, the funny part is that even the tourists converted to working. And so we had a hundred people in this big ass house party that had talks and everyone was doing something. If something was messed up, it would just get fixed. If there was a cooler that was leaking, someone would stop it and clean it up. If there was a pool game going on where people were being too loud, it would like self-police and the talks would go on. If people wanted to talk about something, they would just bounce from the middle of a talk and go outside and start talking about shit. There were laptops out everywhere, there was shit getting done. There was no rule set about it, it just happened. 
we were so hot in this stupid room that this prick built, like it was supposed to be a wedding chapel. I was like, that's funny. Um, but it had these huge skylights. So I knew Jack was one of the get, get shit done people because we were like, all right, it's wicked hot in here. The whole air conditioning fire thing isn't really working for us. What do we do? And Jack's like, uh, let's get a tarp. So then Jack and I climbed the fucking roof of the house and we're like nailing a tarp down to the top of this roof to try and give it some shade. And people inside are like clapping because they're dying from the like Vegas heat. And, and we just were like, okay, so we don't really have to make a rule set and tell people. These are all people that want to be here. They want to be here so badly that they're going to make sure that it stays comfortable for them to stay. That to me, from that first moment of doing it, all the way up through building it to levels where we were renting out hotels and doing weird stuff to now where it's like filling the Tuscany, I am more than honored to know that it has kept the same tradition of people who are here actually want to be here. It's not because they have to be. It's not because, you know, hey, this is better than work or, hey, this is, it's great that I get to go on this boondoggle today and not show up for the talks. People are here because they want to be, and it makes me so, so happy to see that in where my career started. So I thank you guys for that more than you'll ever, ever know. All right, the fun part of not fun. Disclaimer, you know that I swear to deal with it. I don't care. Um, I'll just let you see it. It's so much better than me reading, because like you get to different parts, you're like, fuck, he actually did that. Um, so that's my history of work. Um, as you can see, it started here. It started with people that are in this room um, that I haven't seen in ages that I'm so excited to catch up with. Uh, you know, I run a company called Lara's. We're known for doing red teaming and full scope type adversarial exercises. You can just make up whatever bullshit words and break into stuff. We show people how to fix it. Um, you know, we're. we're we're part of the people. I, I, can, I can start claiming fun things, like we're the reason IBM says they do red teaming. Um, because those guys don't know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> yeah, until they were just like, shit, we keep bumping into this little company of 10 people and they're beating us in deals. What do we do? They're like, I don't know, put it on our line card. Um, and if you work there, awesome. I'm glad you now have a gig doing it for real. Um, We've done some community efforts, the B-Sides thing, trying to make the world a better place in any way that we can, trying to make it a little bit funnier, a little less serious. Um, we, we're trying really, really hard to fix pen testing because people just use that term and then you know you have somebody in the corner who's like feraled away, like hitting the Vanessa's button in autopone and then it just makes me want to fucking murder them. So got a whole bunch of really interesting and smart people from all over the world together to try and create a standard around pen testing because at least if we wrote it down, which key quote that I've ever heard from a friend of mine, the lies we tell today are the best practices of tomorrow. I took that to heart and we decided to just write all this shit down and now it's in NIST, it's in PCI, it's in all these awesome places and every day that I hear it being used somewhere, I'm like, ha, it fucking worked. <laughs> That's great. All we had to do was do it and then the, they took it the rest of the way. And like, I've seen it on the news and I'm like, why is this crazy shit on the news? We got wasted and wrote a big standard. Um, but it's helpful. It's, it's helped try and progress some things. Um, we, we do some stuff like code review at work. Um, we do some incident response work. Um, <laughs> uh, we, do, we do risk assessments. We do physical security. We do some social engineering type stuff on top of all the pen testing and everything else. I'm pretty sure Amanda would kill me if I ever did that, so I don't specifically do it that way. Uh, I try and use a little more tact. All right, uh, so that's great, PowerPoint. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about vulnerabilities because it's starting to get like really stupid out of control, in my opinion. Um, how cool is it? Second from the bottom is high. <laughs> Which is uh, totally where I feel like we're getting to a point of where we're just low is going to be like only your face falls off, you know? Like, it's just the FUD is so way out there right now that it's driving me nuts. So I've been trying to figure out 
how do we get away from it and get a little bit more towards measurement versus people like just freaking out all the time? Because it, it sucks. Eventually, you get there's like too many drunk chicks, explosions, fights, whatever in the movie, and you're like, it's not enough, and then you end up with shit like Fast and the Furious 40. You know, and everybody's 75 years old, and it's just nothing but shit blowing up the whole time, and you're like, man, this movie doesn't have a lot of action in it. You know? And like, I, I feel like that's the worst place for us to go. So I've been, I've been trying really hard to figure out, like, what can I do to change it? So I look kind of at, at where we started, right? We started with equations that completely don't make sense for, for security. And, and CISSP is in here? Yeah, C keep your hand up, CISAs? ISO auditor type people? Okay, anybody remember this one? This, this, the single loss expectancy times annual rate of occurrence, right? Gives you the annualized loss expectancy. What the, huh? Uh, yeah, shadow brokers, how many, yeah, hey guys, do you think you're gonna break into our ship like three or five times this year? <laughs> Who, who is this? Hold on, let me check the list. You know, and then you're like, great, tell the auditors it's only three times. It'll be less money, you know? Like, what the hell is this? That doesn't work. That's not real. It's just, it, it's this, right? It is just, I don't know. It's, it's this many big. How much is the risk? It's risk ultra high versus medium ultra high. It's stupid. Then we're like, okay, so that's kind of crazy. We realized that some actuarial person, you know, no fault to them, you know, they were trying to calculate life expectancy of someone who smoked and has like a bunch of data set to really figure out actually where you're going. Uh, and we just made shit up. But it sounded cool, and we tested people on it, and now they're certified, so like, it's real. Best practices, lies, remember. So then we're like, all right, well maybe we need to visualize this because that'll get more people enrolled. So we made crazy dashboards. Right? So now, we have a dashboard of stuff, and I'm not bagging on Rapid7, this is just a big dashboard. Um, but, you know, hey, whatever, take that you want. Uh, what is this crap? Are we, we're 4%, they're like, yeah, we're 4 wait a second, is 4% good? Or is it bad? Then they have to look and they're like, 4% uh, of our operating systems are vulnerable. Oh, yeah, awesome. Well, what about those? Oh, well, those are crypto locked now. <laughs> so, is I supposed to be happy or not happy about the 4%? And they're like, oh, whatever, at least it wasn't all of them. <laughs> not a good way to manage progress in the environment by like the amount or lack of suck, right? <laughs> but we do it. Um, <clears throat> we thought, all right, cool. Now we have this, we can tie words that people really get afraid of, like risk. You know that it took like 3,000 years for Japanese to make a word for risk because their opinion of that word was that it wasn't specific enough? For real. 3,000 years to make a word that we just throw around all over the place. <coughs> so I look at these and they're like, oh, we made a risk score. This, this right here. Context-driven risk score, 10,742. What? Chickens, goats, risks? Yeah, that's, a, I drowned 10,000 times. I'm like, I'll just settle for not drowning one time. Like, let's not, don't really freak me out. Like, I don't need to be so paranoid that I'm like, oh, a cup of water, I'm gonna die. But it just keeps going. So that didn't really work well, right? Like that approach does not fix anything because we just took those vulnerabilities and we whipped the shit out of the people underneath us and we're like, fix the vulnerabilities, it's your fault. And they're like, I can't, it's a medical device. Somebody's hooked up to the thing right now, like they're gonna die if I catch it. And they're like, I don't care, no more 4%. So what do we do then? We outsourced risk. We said, hey, let somebody else determine how risky it is for us, because then if we make a bad move, we can just blame them. Well, CBSS said it was high, so I did it. And you're like, but that's, but the person died. And they're like, not my problem. Somebody else decided that for me. 
that's also where I don't want to be. I don't want to be in a point where like, you know, hey guys, let's jump off this bridge without a parachute. Uh, nope, doesn't sound good. And they're like, not your decision. Like, Bill, what do you think? Oh yeah, send him. You know, like, this, this is not, not how I should be doing those things. So, plus, have any of you looked at the difference between like CBSS 2 and 3 recently? Because all they did was add critical, right? They were like, hey, let's make shit worse. <laughs> and then take any of the things that were low and bring them to medium because whatever, maybe they'll fix it more. There was like no actual science. It just, it just made shit more risky, which really, really helps us, right? Like, ooh, as soon as we move to this next version of scoring, we suck more. Well, I wouldn't move to the scoring. I'd be like, no, nah, we're just gonna use two. Three's unvetted. Um, <laughs> it's so awesome how we just bullshit our way through things. Um, so that, that's not helping either because if we're managing based on the type of vulnerability or the type of risk, knowing full well that there's always going to be something new that comes out, we chase our tail. And it never stops. We continue to chase our tail over and over and over and over again, and we will never, ever, ever succeed. You can't. It is impossible to succeed managing your program based on vulnerabilities because they will never go away. And even if they do, you are managing towards zero. Like, the end of the day, your most effective security program is zero. Not a number that I want to hear as an executive. Hey man, we're gonna be zero someday, but we're really far in the negative right now. How far? 10,946. What does that mean? I don't know, fuck it. <laughs> you know, like, okay. So, so then, as an industry, we get together and we're like, okay, we gotta get out of this vulnerability thing. We gotta make it real for them, right? So we figure out, like, somebody was probably sitting down one day and just started looking at a crayon box and they're like, I don't know how to describe my job, and execs are idiots, so we'll just use colors and pretend like they're second graders. He'll be like, do you know what red is, Bill? Uh, yeah. Do you know that red is bad? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna do red. And they're like, oh god, please don't. You know? And you're like, but we're gonna. And then we're gonna show you. What are you gonna show me? That you suck still. <laughs> Okay, do I have to? Yes, you have to. Okay, cool. And then they're like, can we do something collaborative? And they're like, sure. What do you have, a blue team and a red? We'll call it purple teaming. Well, that's great, but are we like attaching to his Barney complex? Like, hey man, we love you, it's all good. Purple dinosaur comes in and does your security. It doesn't seem good. So we created this pen testing thing to try and start whittling down the lack of real reality that we're in vulnerabilities and create it as like, I did the thing. The only problem is, is that none of us could agree on what the hell that meant. None of us. I mean like, and there's a lot of things that are, which is why it starts with like scan. I'm doing a pen test, click, go drink coffee, go like search YouTube for things. Right? So the value of that came out the window right in the beginning because we didn't have a good definition of what we were doing and everybody was like, this will be sweet, I can make a bunch of money doing the thing. All I have to do is go crack a copy of Acunetics and I'm a web app guy. All I have to do is crack a copy of Nessus and I'm a network guy. Like, it's, it's great. Not good. Because it doesn't really provide metrics back. And what we're trying to do is not make decisions for people. Right? Our job is not to make a decision for them. Our job is to empower them to make a decision. Right? I, I, I took a really, really long period of my life to do some weird shit when I was trying to figure out social engineering in the like, early 2000s. I went all over the place. I studied in an ashram in India. I went to you know some real weird hippie science shit. And I took a bunch of classes in conjoint family therapy. Because I was like, cool, if these therapists can make two people who are hating on each other like each other again, they must really know how to manipulate people. So, like, I need to learn how to do that. Dick move, I know. But whatever, it sounded good at the time, right? Like, reverse engineering for me was that. So, I take these courses, and, I, and the one big profound thing that I came away from was that they, the conjoint family therapist never made a decision for the couple, ever. That was the one thing they did not do. They could do all sorts of other crazy shit. Fire them up, get them pissed, make them cry, attach them to things, regress them, do all this other stuff. But they couldn't make the decision for them. 
And it hit me really profoundly that that was our job. Our job is to give people the data that they need to feel like they made the right decision and feel good about it. Because at the end of the day, when you look at the etymology of the word security, it is not something that is measurable. It is not a construct that is on or off. It's not something that you can put your hand on or anything else. The word security is only a feeling. That's it. And if our job as security professional, if you called it feelings professional, it'd be a little bit more accurate. I mean, how many of you do consulting? Anybody consultant? Okay, you realize that you're a therapist, right? Like all you're doing is brokering like the shitty time of their day to like, when you can be like, it's okay, you're gonna make progress, I promise, just one step in front of the other. But all of us do that in the enterprise too, right? So it's about empowering people in all of these ways that we've tried to do it. We've never given them the data to really empower them. We've just forced them into a decision. Right? So here's what testing looks like for us. We start at zero, find a whole bunch of shit that's wrong, and then they fix some of it, but they can't fix all of it because of environmental constraints, politics, et cetera, et cetera. So they paid money to prove that their security program was worse than they thought. And somehow we're still a growing industry, which just really fascinates me. You know, like I guess, you know, degrading as a service is where we sit. In the software development world, um, they call those things tech debt, right? Has anybody gone through this silly little chart before, right? Like if it has negative value and it's totally invisible to you, it's technical debt. So what I think is that the way that we've been testing for a really long time is causing testing debt. Every time we go, we test, we find new bad shit, they only fix a certain amount of it, bam, we have debt. I don't think that is a progressive way, I think it's a regressive way for the environment. So I just figure, okay, we're doing it wrong. Um, if I could pull that off, I would do it. But I feel like the, the like learning curve <laughs> is something that would be really hard for me to get over. Right. So I started thinking about like adversaries, right? And then the realistic adversaries that were actually there. And then the theoretical adversaries, right? The maelstrom, right? Like, the whole internet is going to kill you. What do we do? I mean, well, okay, we could show them all of the bad and say, these are all the ways that the internet is gonna kill you and then people are just gonna be afraid of the water forever. Like, if I thought about all the ways I could die in the ocean, I would never get in the ocean. I mean, the more times I watch Shark Week, the more times, I like, I won't even get in a pool. Like, it, it sucks to drink enough water. I'm like, mm, I don't know, fuck it. <laughs> you know, like, I'll have coffee, it's safer. <laughs> so so I, I, I do some skill trade, right? Like, I always try and see if I can trade with people outside of my industry to figure out what I'm doing wrong. Because I know I do a lot of wrong stuff. Um, and so I was working with the guys at United in their flight simulation team. Because uh, they were close, and it was awesome, and what a cool machine. And if I could con them into like getting me into a place where I could like fly a giant flight simulator, that's a great deal. And what I learned from talking with some of those cats is that like I personally have been fucking up pretty much my whole career in doing testing. Because they said something so simple and so profound. Is they were like, well, the reason that we have these is because we want to put the pilots in a situation that's really, really risky, but not lose our pilot or a really expensive airplane. And I'm like, oh, why didn't I think about that? That was what we're really, we're not emulating attackers, we're reducing risk by testing in a fashion that's controllable. Like, completely different story. Now nobody thinks that I'm in a hood, they think I'm in a fucking lab coat. Like, how much more respect would I have gotten in my career had I not been like, I'm the criminal, instead of like, I'm the scientist. It would have been a completely different life that I would have had. And it kicked my butt. So I'm like, okay, cool. How do I bring in the science to this? So you first start off and you're like, let's just take all the crap that we already do and reposition it. So, okay, get people who can do the hack thing, complain about the scope, hack all the shit, write up stuff, tell people that they suck, you know, add, add advancement, like being able to meet with the defense team, tell the defense that they suck, tell the, the, the other guys that they suck, and then, you know, okay, we're close. I'm like, no, that's probably, probably, not, probably not a simulation. 
So we wanted to get to a point where we could move into a place where we're simulating and not harming the environment, not being treated like thugs with hoodies on, and, and actually proving that the work that we do, at the end of the day, every single day, the company is better, not worse. Yeah? Worth. So, we started looking at like how, is, how are things repeatable. Um, good start to how it's repeatable, but I think they're full of shit. <laughs> Personal opinion. Um, great ideas on the top, you know, from reconnaissance all the way down to actions on objectives through C2. Excellent. Agree with some of that stuff. Probably why a lot of those steps are really close to what we wrote in, pen to, in the Pentest standard. Right? Being able to go and step through methodologically in every single way that we're going to be attacking the environment so that somebody knows what's coming at them and exactly knows how they're supposed to defend against it. And if they don't do the job in between them, we have some type of measurement. The part that I really have a problem with is this absolutely fucking ridiculous chain on the blue team side. Right? Like if I was a blue teamer, I would just laugh at this. Okay, first detect. That's the first part, detect. Alright? I see them. They're doing bad things. And they're like, deny them from doing the bad things. And they're like, okay, they're denied. Attack's over. Right? Like if they denied them. Or like they go back to doing bad things, then you detect them and deny them again. Great, close loop, it's fucking over with. Why disrupt? Like what, like we blocked them, but now we're gonna mess with them, ready? So for the rest of this process, we're gonna first disrupt them, which I don't know what that means, but whatever, we're gonna find some way to piss them off. Then, we're gonna degrade them. What do you like, get on a honey pot and talk shit to them through like message? Yeah, what's up dog, you can't hack into our shit? Ah! <laughs> Come at me, bro! You know? <laughs> and, then, and then, first, okay, you disrupted them, you degraded them and pissed them off more, now you're gonna deceive them, like, JK, I'm actually Sears. <gasps> like, what? what? Huh? What, like, who thought of that shit? And people use this for real and talk to executives who aren't in the same, like, community as us. Like, in, in us, we, we understand what this really means. But they look at this and they're just like, what the hell is all this other shit that you're trying to do? Like, do you seriously stop an attacker and then talk shit to them and like tweet at them and like, and like then make fun of them and then get to a point where you like deceive them by like wearing a clown suit and like being like, haha, I'm not even a defender. Um, and then destroy. What, like, do you send people to their fucking house and kill them? <laughs> you know, like, okay, Lockheed, really good. Go back to making, like, weapons and shit. Stay out of our cyberspace. Like, we, not, not how shit works in the real world. Um, but I like, I like how, how David started looking at these things. Anybody seen the, oh, Pyramid of Pain? Right? It's a great idea. It's really good, and the thing that you start to see quickly in an environment is if identifying hash values is the bottom, right? If you can't identify a hash value in your environment across all your shit, you have not met step one. <laughs> Hard to think about because people are like, but I can do the IP address thing, but like, but you still have to the hash values. And they're like, fuck, <laughs> back to step one, right? But if we manage things all the way up to the top, what does it do for us? Just like a flight simulator does for the people and the pilots in the airplane, if we get to do the toughest exercises, it starts to strengthen us, right? We're not doing things that are basic. We're not achieving basic levels of success. We're extending the program and forcing its progress through training, through exercise, through development, through experience. Right? The people in the world who wear the, I hope someone here is wearing it so I can talk shit on you. Um, the, who wear the, like, there's no patch for human stupidity t-shirt, those people are fucking morons. Why? Oh, because what's the patch? What's the patch for stupidity? I mean, aside from death. <laughs> Education and experience, right. Right, stove is hot. Ah, fuck, that's hot, you're an idiot. Okay, I'm just not gonna touch that again. Bam, learned. Game over, patch installed, right? But if we can do this at the highest level, this stuff underneath here is gonna be the easy stuff. This is the stuff where we're gonna be banging at them so hard they're gonna be like, really? 
really? You're using the same like uh, attacker at mycompanyname.com? Like, come on, man. Like, it's step it up a little bit. We're a little bit better than that now. Like, I want the defenders to talk shit. If they're going to deceive and degrade and destroy and all that stuff, do it to me. Like, because I'll at least play. Like, the attackers are probably just going to get more mad, and then your thing is going to be in the bee's nest, and you're going to wonder why it's stung. So, I've been working with MITRE and a couple other organizations to try and start quantifying and qualifying the different types of attacks that exist out there. So, has anybody seen attack? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes? Do you, have you used it yet? Yes. Okay, good. So, attack is out there trying to say in each one of these, persistence, privest, all the way down to command control, just like we had in P-test, what are the actual techniques that are there? DLL injection, cross-loading, cradling, et cetera, et cetera. Being able to make a centralized knowledge repository of what those attacks are, so that if we could start testing those types of things, we're actually to the point of that tough, that testing TTPs. We're not just down at this bottom finding vulns and whatever else. We're finding shit you can actually do, you can respond to, and you can move forward from. So our charter, when we were working on the next way of trying to manage these things and not have any more debt, was create a sock of badasses who were treated like fighter pilots and not like shit. And then to automate as much of the defense and offense as we could so that then the smart people are training the machine, not trying to keep the machine running which I think is our biggest problem right now on the defense side, is that people are trying to use bail and wire and duct tape to keep the whole fucking thing together when it should be a giant machine that all we're doing is tuning, right? We should be like Formula One status. We shouldn't be like, you know, a, a, a gremlin. <laughs> and my overall goal was if I could get enough metrics, just like the actuarials predict death, predict lifespan, I could predict attacks. Not just an attack, I could predict the entire attack chain, how successful it would be, how fast we would catch them, how good our defenses are, and be able to do all of those things before it ever happened. Sound cool? Okay, quick way to do it. Just, just you know, fucking easy. Um, this is a workflow, that's how you do it, bam. Mic drop. <laughs> So you gotta, you gotta make a strategy. This, this particular strategy at the beginning was talking through, all right, what, is it, what does it look like when we were doing a pen test, right? So from engagement, then going through intel and goal assessment, target acquisition, exploitation, privest, lateral movement, impact, persistence, exfil, then we report stuff, and you're usually gone, you hand the customer the report, they go back, they cry, they're pissed, they're in tech debt, they're in testing debt, we come back, we'll like see you next year, we'll create more debt the next time. They're like, thanks for giving us value, and they leave. So instead, we're like, all right, well, we should probably start working with the teams on this stuff. So what are we going to do? Well, I don't want to hand them a report. The report's useless for them. It doesn't give them any experience at all. I want to say, I was successful at gathering intel these different ways. Sit me down with somebody in the sock. Sit me down with somebody who's on the defensive side. I'm going to redo those things, and we're going to simulate with that pilot this particular exercise. They're going to train and tune their defenses just on me in that moment, in that exercise, and we're going to have a rule set, we're going to have some defenses built that increase our capability that day. Right? Not a report, not any of this shit. That day, shit's going to change. Right? So then, all we have to do is continue around the circle and take all the other places that we had some success and sim it. And by the time we get to the end of this project, shit will be different in that environment. Fact. It will be different. The doorstop report won't matter because we will have changed the environment. Instead of going into debt, we're going to show positive increase because all of this stuff that I found, even if I couldn't protect against it, it was now a task item for me to do something about it. Right? No longer am I just handing my report down to the sysadmins and be like, hey, retard, you didn't patch your shit. <laughs> you know, like, back to the socks so I can watch you do. It was, hey, you didn't patch your stuff. I'm going to assume you can do nothing about it. Hopefully you can help me out. I need to go back and figure out how I see when people are doing bad stuff to your thing. I'll let you know if I figure that out. And if I do figure it out, let me know who to call or what buzzer to ring. 
right? So then you can get on the job and, and in between, get it as close as you can. Now I have improvement. I have to look at coverage, right? I have to see what do I have in the environment that's actually gonna be able to get me there. This is one of those retarded eye charts that I've made. <laughs> but at the same time, as soon as you do things in this, if you say, all right, I've got IDS, IPS, right? And it's gonna cover these areas of the attack chain. Instead of looking at it as, you know, right now what do people do like take the Gartner chart and overlay it and be like this is how many magic quadrants I have and like I only have six out of the nine magic quadrant things like my security program needs more money but that doesn't help but if I can do it based on everything in the attack chain and say do I have capabilities with this thing finding C2 do I have capabilities stopping C2 if my fire eye goes tango uniform Am I screwed? Is that the only control that I have that stops it? Should I be telling my team, hey, we need to get redundancy in that box because it's the sole control that gives us visibility into this phase of the attack? <clears throat> Wouldn't that be a more valuable finding than like, yeah, WordPress is vulnerable again? You know, good, let it be vulnerable. At least I'm gonna stop it once they own some shit. Like, that's what I wanna see. And what you'll find really quickly is that you're gonna find that you have products that are tripled up in one area and complete, utter fail, total gap in another area. And you can be able to look at the program and go, oh hey, we should probably do something that does this. And they're like, why would we do that? It's not in the, quad the, the, the quadrant. And be like, we need to get away from that shit. We need to just make shit that works. Like, I don't give a hell oh, who's the leader. If I can be capable with some piece of technology that's 25 years old, I'm capable with it. I, mean, I was talking about this last night, it blew my mind thinking about it. My Sidewinder firewall that I installed at Shukarni Bacon for our first internet connection would have stopped every single one of the fucking DNS tunnels that's used. Every single one of them. My 20 year old firewall, right? How come my new shit doesn't do that? Like, I should just go back to that, it worked. But no, we gotta buy the new hop thing. We gotta share our information. Hmm. You really have to share. <laughs> what? I'm old. I like care bears. Um, so that's part of the reason that we started with Attack. Um, you know, Rob and a bunch of other people started with Pwn Wiki. If anybody's seen that, right? Internal little wiki that has a bunch of attacks stood up already in it of like what tools you use and how you use those tools and where you use those tools and all that stuff. Really cool because now if I can give my attacker tools and techniques, what switches I use, the ways that I got around things, app bypass, whatever else, any of the scripts that I have, any of the like commercial tools that exist there, or the open source tools, and I can write all that out, that means that when my defenders have time and they want to go do rule writing, by the way, I'm calling it rule writing because I have a really big problem with hunting. Um, but anytime they want to go do rule writing, they can find something to write it against. They can go and run all the same shit that I run. They don't have to call my team. They can go run it themselves. And then the next time my team's doing a campaign, we're gonna get caught and they'll be like, bam, gotcha bitch, juggernaut. You know, like, it, it'll be awesome. My biggest problem with the whole hunting word, maybe one of you guys can answer. I haven't found someone that can answer it yet, so please educate me. What the fuck are you hunting? Anyone? Serious, I'm, I'm seriously asking, does anyone know when they say that they have a hunt team, what in the fuck are they hunting? Please. Anomalies. Anomalies. So they are hunting for mystery. They're like fucking Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Unauthorized shit. Unauthorized shit, right? M more unknowns. What's authorized, what's not authorized? I don't know. Do you have a catalog of everything that's authorized? Well, yeah, I mean, that's what, mind blown, no idea. You know what? What is this? It's a developer. Fuck them, unauthorized. You know, like, all they do is make up new shit that we've never seen. Delete them from the network. We're like, oh, damn it, our product's dead. Right? It just kills me to hear it. I'm not bagging on people who are on hunt teams. You're just in shitty marketing positions. You know, like, you're probably well better off doing real defense stuff and being the engineer that you actually are versus the fucked up marketing part, right? So we're trying to make it to a point where there is something to hunt. 
if I have a repeatable process, if I'm attacking you in a measurable way, you have something to hunt, which is me, or my scripts, or my functions. And if I fired 25 attacks that day, and you're hunting, and you find six attacks that day, you did not find all the shit you need to find. Right? Measure. If, I mean, it, it's like the difference between like a hunter in the woods and like a postal service worker, where like the hunter in the woods like takes aim at something, a postal service worker just, and just like rolls in and they're like, yeah, I hunted them all. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really bad look for us. So we've also made CAR. Um, the, the MITRE guys have been working on this. CAR is the, the analytic repository. So these are all the different types of analytics that exist out there currently to do determination against particular types of attacks. So ways that you can find it, what it is, what the hypothesis of that particular attack type is, the attack method, the different items that are used. Um, anybody seen Unfetter yet? If you haven't, get ready for the awesome. Um, so Unfitter was a project that broke out of some MITRE things um, that got picked up by the NSA and Purple Labs IO guys and started becoming a community development project so that you could get a big, giant, really awesome elk cluster and start feeding all of your attack data and all of your defense data into it and start correlating those things so that when I say I released four rabbits, you can say I shot four rabbits and we know that it's right. When you say, I released four rabbits, and you're like, I shot 95 rabbits, you're like, well, <laughs> maybe you shot a little too much, you know? Like, the thing that was 6'5 and 260 wasn't a rabbit, and they're like, mm, dead anyway, <laughs> you know? Um, I, this is a, like, 10-hour class by itself, but I just want to show you that some of these things are getting made so that it's not vaporware. It's stuff that we've able to POC all the way from attack down to did the defenders see it? How well did they capture it? At what time did they capture it? So we take examples, right? So like account discovery, doing net commands. You know the, the JP cert did an amazing article about all the different attacker types they had investigated in 2016, right? And out of those attacker types in 2016, they found that more than 90% of them used these net commands. So Gates and I started making the script together to just emulate running the net commands. Because if JP Cert and every attack that they had had 90 plus percent of people using these net commands, then I sure as hell better be able to detect when these things are being run. Because even if all my other shit fails, I got a 90% chance of catching these assholes once they run a net command. Awesome. Now granted, there's some noise that happens here. But if you start an aggregate count of like ran this command, then ran this one, then ran this one, then ran another one, the alert goes up really, really, really fast and it's super high resolution, right? Simple topics like this are things that create huge amounts of effectiveness in the defense program. Then what we can do after that is start saying how many times did we get this count? So I take my net command, I put it in the GPO, I send it to 15 different parts of my network and different machines, I have it auto run the thing, and then I, I look back at my telemetry and I go, oh, I ran it 15 times, but I only got four alerts. And weirdly enough, my four alerts, like one of them came from FireEye, one of them came from like a Splunk rule that I had, one of them came from like some random, you know, like, oh, I had CA hips installed. And they're like, why the fuck do you have that? And they're like, I don't know, but it was still there. You know, one of them was like an error because we sent it to a mainframe, you know? <laughs> but you start learning all these things about your environment, how it actually works during an attack, and this shit gets solved instantly, right? Like, you know exactly how to solve it. This is the tool that I use, this is how I saw it. Is it a coverage gap, or did I not implement this rule set somewhere the right way, right? So then we have to simulate things. Once we simulate them, we gotta score them. So when we're scoring our attacks, We'll get maturity on the detection, we'll get maturity on protection, we'll get confidence. Confidence isn't just like how you felt that morning, it's things like, well, I ran this thing five times, it only got alerted once, so I'm not very confident that if this ran in some random part that you picked of our network, one-fifth of the time, it would catch it. So I'm a very low level of confidence, even though I know what my maturity is. All right? We'll give it a sophistication. Anybody use sticks? So sticks is pretty good for, for general sophistications from like, elite innovator, you're never gonna see our cool shit, down to like, 
Uh, it's a script kitty, nobody really cares. I like how it's called aspirant at the bottom. Like, I want to be a hacker. And that's before novice. It's like, I wish I was a hacker. So I just click this load button over here. Um, we can get the detection rates. Then we can start finding really cool things like how sophisticated was that attack? How well did we detect against it? How easy could we protect against it? And how fast could we respond? So these are some eye charts. So when, when you get slides or if you feel like looking at them later, it'll make way more sense. Um, but effectively, it's take a technique like you know, LSAS recovery, figure out what the methods of protection are, right? catalog those things so that even as my defense team, if I think that one of these things happened, I could go to this sheet and go, oh, look in these different product sets. Right? I can use Unfetter to do that. I can say, oh, we didn't find this thing. Click on this. Here's the thing we can go to. Find what the sophistication is. Determine the level of maturity, right, based on these scores, right? Like, oh, it's a, it's a three, we have centralized logs, you know, it's functional, but it's not to the point where it, like, sets off the red alarm. Timing is really important here because this helps us predict the future, right? If I can figure out all these simulations and time, I can then use iterative math to figure out what it's going to look like in the future. Make sense? Kind of? Sort of. All right. So now I'm going to take these things and I'm going to map them out across all of the attack chain. Now, in each one of these, I've been able to simulate these different things, process enumeration, you know, escapes, buffer overflows, ways that I'm doing lateral movement, one to many remote services, and all of these different areas, right? So what am I doing? I'm doing unit testing. Right? Make sense? Basic unit testing. So we've got to pick that out a little bit more and try and get an idea of what the attack chains are. Octopus of death. This is what happens when you simulate all of the asset paths inside of that chain and you use Monte Carlo iterations to generate the top 1 million APT threats. Now the way that you do that is just say, we have all of these potential ways of attacking that we've simulated. Give me a million different iterations of people using different techniques each time and then bubble up to the top the ones that are the most risky. I hate that fucking one. The ones that will work the best. I, I have to untrain myself. Um, and when I find the ones that are going to work the best, and I find the ones that are going to be most successful, and I find the ones that are gonna, we're going to have the least ability to defend ourselves again, that's the one I need to simulate first because that's the shit that's going to hurt us. We know it's going to hurt us. It's a fact. We don't need some pen tester to come in and be like, ha ha ha. GPP in your domain, got your admin password, what's up? And you're like, yeah, I know. Like, got it. Thank you for charging me 10 grand to do shit I can do in two minutes. Like, that I that was part of the configuration. Cool part about it is we can also, oh, this, the, you got, some, somebody's gonna get this before I go to the next slide, so I'm gonna sit here for a second. Um, really cool thing, Carrot, one of the other minor frameworks, when we're categorizing these attacks, started digesting different intelligence reports. Right? This is how you can make threat intelligence operational. Okay? Meaning, if I took the Mandian APT95 report, or whatever it's called, AccuFisheye, whatever they're called now, um, if I took that report and broke that down to TTPs, not all the bullshit wording and FUD and scare tactics of why they need to sell you their shit, just what exactly happened from that attacker group, I could break down exactly what it was like to be attacked by ABT, whatever. And if I had simulated all those things before, I could go into my simulation chart and say, TTP this, 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 and this, and go, ooh, we've never simulated that one. Quick, let's go simulate it, go simulate it, go back, and I can tell you probability of that group attacking us, the effectiveness level of that group attacking us, and what time it would take for us to find that particular adversary group when they're attacking my environment. How cool would that be to tell an executive when they say, how vulnerable are we to ABT28? You're like, I have this level of confidence that we are this vulnerable, but we will catch them at this point of their attack. They'd be like, damn, you actually knew that? <laughs> Holy shit. You know, like, like, let me go tell my other executive boys, I got my, I got my dog on it. Like, woo, woo, like he's, he's got this. Right? Anybody figure out what this means? Thug life. Yes, ABT thug life. That's what we're getting towards. 
We want to get it to a point where it's so gangster that they can't mess with us. Or when they do, it hurts really bad. All right, lastly, defensive measurement. Once you get all this stuff, and if you can predict the future, what else do we need to do? We need to figure out how to make our defenders better. We need to make it less drag. We need to make them improve as defenders. We need them to be able to measure themselves if you gamify it, if they're into that gamification thing. If they're just trying to get up to their 100% score or whatever, they need to be able to see how well they're doing against the attackers. You know, not only am I going to tell them, hey, you successfully hunted five out of five rabbits today, I'm going to say you killed five out of five rabbits faster than anyone else in the world today. And they're going to be like, oh, defense so hard. <laughs> right? Like, I got so much time, I can do something else. So we got to give them metrics back so that they understand how to improve their own process. We can do that by searching just for what they're searching for. So Chris and I have been working on this for a, a while and implementing these things live, uh, both at, at Uber and at some organizations where we're providing them a full service red team all day, every day, building these models for them. And it's cool because we can now go in to one of their agent engines and say, I want to see all of your defenders and how many of them searched for this string or this IP address or this artifact or IOC that I know I left there and set up all my search capabilities and wait. And I can see in a real-time dashboard how fast each defender is responding to me and where they're at in the ticketing process, pull the ticket in, be able to look at the ticket timestamp, be able to look at when they made a search for my thing that was bad, and show them mean time to detection without them ever having to give me a report. It's so cool. Because I can actually tell them how well they're doing, and then they can look back at it and be like, damn it, that was when I went to lunch. And you're like, not my problem. You know, like, lunch is lunch. Maybe the next time that you get the attack, you'll stay in it until you move it to the next level or fix it. But you can see these things and you can start measuring them over time. And then as they get to all of these different pieces of annual analytics, you now can create the thing that every executive in the world wants, which is a dashboard. People fucking love dashboards. Back to the vulnerability thing. Because they love it so much, you gotta give it to them. But this dashboard is different. Because now we're talking about every time we run one of these simulations, all of these metrics go positive. They don't go negative, right? I can say that because we're staying in it, and if they want to focus on, oh, we, we think we're going to have more nation state stuff, great, I'm going to focus on increasing the ability inside of this innovator category, right? I can do things like show them maturity over time and the breakdown. I can show them how many different techniques we had and at what part of the attack chain are we the most capable, right? Like, if we're focusing everything on C2, like, okay, well, by then we've probably lost all our shit. Maybe we should move it a little bit earlier. But if we have stuff really early and have suck after that, then we're hoping that, you know, our magic Eminem firewall stops everything and then after that we're like, well, if they steal shit, at least we tried. You know? But all of these things show them stuff. They show them coverage. They show them really what tools they're relying on because we know what tool picked up that particular alert or what analyst was using what tool and how well and effectively they were using it, right? We have this great simulation, but really to me, it solves the problem that I have had my entire career at communicating. The problem is this, charts. No. The, the problem is to me, you have this idea of total protection detection response, right? Fully capable, kicked it, we win concept, right? Whether that's an attack, whether that's a campaign, whatever else. You have the potential. The potential is like, well, in that coverage matrix, we had everything covered versus we had some gaps in coverage. Maybe we can't find, you know, maybe we don't have net flow data. Maybe we won't have this kind of data or that data. So there's some attacks that we're just not going to see because we don't have the potential to see it. But the real thing that I wanted to see was what our actual capability was. Even though we had the potential to see all this stuff, did we wait? Did we not? Did we not see it? Did we not execute on our full potential in the environment because we were at lunch, because we didn't give a crap, because the alert broke, because there was some logging engine thing, that, like whatever all these intrinsic problem things are, 
did we actually execute at our capability level, or do we have coverage problems? The thing that I found really, really awesome about this is it made my case for something that I have not been able to measure my entire career, which is my constant philosophy of please stop buying shit. Just please stop buying stuff. If you buy more shit, it's not going to help you. So I tried to walk down the path of, if you buy more shit, you have a larger attack surface. If I put antivirus on a machine, technically I have more ways to attack the machine, not less. Because I added a new vector of attack. Right? Simple. But they're like, no, fuck you. <laughs> okay, fine. But now I've gotten to this point where we're simulating these things and I can prove to them without a shadow of a doubt that if this was 40% and this was 20%, by adding something new into the program and increasing the potential, I have actually made the program worse. I have proved to them on a piece of paper, on a graph that they can see and they can read that actual stays here and our execution gap grew because you bought new shit. That to me was one of those moments in my career so far where I, have, I felt like I found the friggin' Rosetta Stone of being able to finally explain to them there are ways to fix this that will actually work that is not in you going and buying more crap. I know that sucks for every vendor in the world. But don't worry, they'll come back and buy shit anyway. Right? Um, I'm almost done ranting. So the future of this to me is that I don't want to continue to play this front that like we're attackers and hackers and and we 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 do all these things we simulate the criminal because it's bullshit we don't I mean I don't know how many of you have gotten permission in a scope to like grab an executive and like throw them down a flight of stairs and like put a gun in their mouth and be like log into your shit because that's how I do it <laughs> if I was a criminal I wouldn't do all the fancy hacking things I'd beat the hell out of them and like throw them in a trunk and let them sit there for like a day and then pull them out and be like, you wanna see your kids again? Be like, sweet, let me see your RSA token, dog. You know, like log in. Like I'll tell you what to type, you did it. Right? That's a criminal. Like we're trying to simulate things and we need to expand our scope of simulation and get the level of respect in that scope of expansion so that we can be an instrument for making defense better. We can be a flight simulator for the fighter pilots that need to be up there protecting us all day, every day. And we need to lower the level of risk that those people have in their training scenarios. Oh, that's any questions on stuff? I don't know where to stop with that. It's just, I feel like, uh, I feel like we have a big opportunity to change the message. Uh, and the more we change the message, the more respect we're going to get. And the more respect we get, the more fun shit we get to do. Thank you, guys.